You bet you we're going to be out of here before 12 o'clock. Isn't that wonderful news, huh? It's 22 minutes to 12 by my clock. We will be going out the door at the stroke of 12, according to my Timex, okay? It's really a nice watch, boy. It's easy to read. Good. Runs good. Takes a licking, keeps on picking, and all that kind of thing, you know. So, now, a part of what happens to me when I move down into this time called Easter and all of the events prior to and all, I do lots and lots of reading. I love to read. Number one, if you're going to go into the ministry, ask God to make you love to read. I never did that. I just always loved to read from the time I was a kid. I really wasn't that much smarter than other kids. I did jump a grade and all that kind of thing, but I, uh, I read a lot. I love to read, and if you read, you're going to learn. And if you read the right stuff, I used to, I used to just devour the World Book Encyclopedia. Just love that thing. And I, many times, I said to my dad when I got old enough to know that that set him back some serious money, and and we didn't have any money. I didn't know that when I was a kid. We always had a house, and we had food, and sometimes we had a car, and I thought we had plenty. But the investment he made in World Book for us kids was really a great one. And, uh, and, and just reading, getting information uh, helps you in school like everything. And then the more you read, that thirst for knowledge kind of grows on you. And I still have that. I just, uh, I, I put a lot of pressure on my people. You gotta read. My staff people have an assignment. They have to read at least one book a month and then share that with us. And uh, that's good for us. And they come in, they've read a great book, and they're all excited, and they tell the rest of us about this great book. And then other folks say, I need to read that great book. And that, you know, that's all in your own time that you do that kind. But you grow through that reading. And that's part of why we push this thing uh, with the Bible House. Seriously, I know that some people say, oh, I know the church makes money on that deal. Not at those prices, pal. Uh, we don't make a dime. And uh, Bible House still makes a nickel or two. But that's all right. That's their business. They need to make a nickel or two, and they're not going to make it. They'll fold up and go out of business. So don't ever tell somebody to sell to you so cheap that they can't make a profit, because if they don't make a profit, it's over. And uh, in, in all that reading that I do, I get so much information stacked up and backlogged that I'm thinking about that I haven't had a chance to preach it all. And, and so I, I come to you this morning, and I, I want to do a thing that goes back to that week prior to the crucifixion and resurrection. Uh, part of what many folks have never paid attention to, and it's, it's not because you're dumb, nobody's ever called it to your attention. A good part of each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a good part of the information there is that which happened between what we call Palm Sunday, what I like to call Parade Sunday, and the crucifixion and resurrection. Lots of information on that one week, those few days. And if you don't know that, that gets by you, and, and it's never been dawned on you. That's why. But when we get into Mark chapter 13, for example, uh, we're in the middle. The big parade has happened. And uh, things, uh, things are sensational. You know, the disciples, they're riding this popularity pole. George Bush wishes he had this thing going for him right now like that. It was big. They'd, they'd done all this big thing, and things hadn't started to go downhill yet. Jesus has cleaned out the temple, and, and there's a lot of action, and it's an exciting week, and you get to be a part of it, and you're so filled up with excitement that when Jesus is quiet, you want to generate some kind of conversation. And so they came out of the temple in Mark 13, and that's your assignment, read Mark 13 this week. As he was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, I don't know which one, but one of them, he couldn't stand Jesus being so quiet. He said, teacher, what a beautiful building this is. Look at the decorated stonework on the walls. Now that's just kind of a flip little statement because he couldn't stand silence. It's kind of like, you know, uh, boy, these are some rocks, aren't they? Huh? Look at them, got great decoration. No graffiti, but great decoration on the rocks. And Jesus just kind of fired back at him. Yeah, look, go ahead, look. For not one stone will be left upon another except as ruins. He said, boy, kind of 
snapped a little there, didn't he? And then they walk on across to the slopes of the Mount of Olives. And they're sitting there on the grass having a little picnic like Woodward Park deal, you know. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, the four of these guys, they get over, they get Jesus aside, and they say, just when is all this going to happen to the temple? Hey, the temple wasn't quite finished. They'd been working on this temple for 50 years, and it wasn't quite finished yet, but it was a beautiful building. Just when is all this going to happen to the temple? Will there be some warning ahead of time? And Jesus launches into this thing that we call the Olivet Discourse. That's such a wonderful statement. It was really kind of the the doomsday outburst because it's one of the longest recorded sermons that Jesus gave and he just fired at him with machine gun staccato. He lays this on him. This is what he said. He said, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come declaring themselves to be your Messiah and will lead many astray. And wars will come. And they'll break out near and far. And this is not a signal of the end time. And he goes on and on. We're going to pick that up in a moment. But I want to tell you what happened here. What I think happened. We're not going to look at all of the stuff that we normally look at here in Mark 13. Or over in Matthew 24 or Luke 21. That's all recorded in those three places. I want us to take a look at something that I think gives us a little insight into the clues of the emotional state of Jesus as he nears his own time of trauma. Boy, the disciples on the one hand, they're excited. Everything is swinging. Everything's beautiful. And Jesus knows with every passing hour, he is closer to the cross. And I believe that we see some anxiety coming through what he had to say to them in this speech that he delivered. Jesus' response to pain is much like our response to pain. He felt scared. And he wanted it to go away. Don't ever forget. He didn't get before the Lord and say, thank you, Father, I'm really anticipating the glorious opportunity to go all the way to the cross and die there for the sins of the people. Hallelujah, this is going to be fun. That is not what he said. He prayed three times. Three times. As he wept and as he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, he prayed, take this cup from me. Book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 5 and verse 7, while he was here on earth, he pleaded with God, praying with tears and agony of soul to the only one who could save him from premature death. Premature death. Not just death, that was part of it, but the attack of Satan so severe against him. Don't ever forget If Satan could have killed him in the garden, if he would have collapsed and died from the overwhelming pressure of that which he was facing, we could take this book and burn it because it's not true. But he didn't. I had a funeral service some months ago in this sanctuary for a man I did not know well. He was early 50s. He was in great shape. But he was under incredible emotional pressure. His best friends who were with him the day before he died told me afterwards, this man died of a broken heart. You see, it's possible that the emotional load is so heavy that it wipes us out and Satan would have done anything he could to have taken Jesus out prematurely and any other way but the cross. Satan knows how to read. He knows what's in the Old Testament. He knows all the predictions concerning that Jesus would come and would be hanged on a cross and would die in that place for us as a substitute for us. And Jesus went all the way to the cross, but believe me, 
He wept and he hurt and his impending death was like the ticking of a time bomb inside of him. You see, I think that all too often when we are under incredible stress, perhaps to the point of tears and frustration and to get alone somewhere and cry things out to God. Sometimes we look at ourselves and say, I'm a pathetic excuse for a believer. If I really trusted God, I could walk this way joyfully. Pain is pain is pain, my friend. And Jesus felt it and acknowledged it here in his own anxiety as he fired off this to the disciples. I was in a meeting this last week with a dozen men and we were talking about Fresno and the needs of this city and we kind of closed down the meeting and decided to pray a while. And one of the pastors, a wonderful guy, he began to pray and he began to say, Lord, whatever the cost is to us personally, we're willing to shoulder that cost. Whatever the pain is, whatever the personal involvement we're willing for that to save this city and I listened to him pray and when he finished I began to pray and I said Lord I, I've had all the heavy suffering I want I don't want anymore if that's what we've got to suffer then I will, but I want to tell you right now, I don't want any more deep, deep water to walk through. And I leave it with you. See, I think sometimes we get too glib about what we're willing to give up. That particular man, he's a, I say again, he's a wonderful man. He's never buried a child. He doesn't know the pain and the loss and the hurt that stays with you all of your life. And even though you, you move ahead and the joy of the Lord is your strength, you still remember that pain. I, I deal daily with people in heavy, heavy, heavy pain and loss. And I can identify anxiety brings us to a place to where we will cry out to the Lord. And I pray you don't hold back from that. If you feel you must just weep before God, do it. No sign of weakness. It's a sign of making good sense. But then I notice something else. I notice his compassion. He says all these terrible things are going to happen. He says to his disciples, and he's talking about two things. One is he's talking about the coming destruction of that temple, and it happened in 70 A.D., but he's also talking about the end time. And Jesus talked about things with both of those things in view. But look what he says to these right in front of him. When these things begin to happen, watch out, for you'll be in great danger. You'll be dragged before the courts and beaten in the synagogues and accused before governors and kings of being my followers. Are you a follower of Jesus? He said, this is your opportunity to tell them the good news. Hey, what's the good news? Jesus is alive, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is alive and death could not hold him. That's the good news. And he says, and this good news must first be made known in every nation before the end time finally comes. When you're arrested and stand trial, don't worry about what to say in your defense. Just say what God tells you to, and then you'll not be speaking, but the Holy Spirit will. And brothers will betray, betray brothers each unto death. Fathers will betray their own children. Children betray their parents to be killed. Everyone will hate you because you're mine. And when you see the horrible thing standing in the temple, flee if you can. Listen to the compassion. If you can run away, flee to the Judean hills. Hurry. If you're on your rooftop porch, don't even go back into the house. Just get out of there. If you're out in the field, don't return for money or clothes. Get to the mountains and get out of the way. Woe to pregnant women in those days and to mothers nursing their children and pray that your flight will not be in winter. 
For those will be days of such horror as have never been seen. Listen to his compassion. What man would in the middle of this kind of thing say, woe to the pregnant mothers and to the nursing mothers? Oh, theirs is a special heavy load of responsibility. And he took into consideration, just speak that word that tells us the compassion of his heart. And the compassion for the disciples shines through there even darkly. You're going to be handed over to be persecuted and to be put to death. Grim future. Humiliation awaited them. And you never know as a follower of Jesus Christ whether you're going to be in that group or be in a different group. You don't understand. We don't understand the sovereignty of God. So often I've sat with Bob and Rena and talked about their time in Borneo and talked about when World War II came and the Japanese immediately went for Borneo because they needed the petroleum supplies that were there in that country. They have no petroleum in their own country and they went immediately to go and take that from the Dutch. And Bob and Rena and their two kids hid by day and traveled by night to finally get to the coast to try to find a boat that would take them to Java and eventually to Australia, Australia and eventually back to America, and they made it. But I've listened to them talk so often of dear, dear friends of theirs, missionaries who were captured and some were killed and others were put in concentration camps, others starved to death in that place, others lost their minds. And even though they were later freed and came home, mentally they were never right. Heavy heavy pressure and Jesus speaks with compassion for these who are his followers who will stand and identify themselves as his followers that he cares about us in the midst of that stress but he makes no allowance for us to back down from doing his will and doing his work great compassion that he has for us and then he has one other thing that's so good well, you unload this on these disciples. They're just mashed with the heaviness of what he's laid on them. And it's so good that we have this report that he gives. In verse 24, he said, After the tribulation ends and the sun will grow dim and the moon will not shine and the stars will fall and the heavens will convulse. This is the wildest thing that's ever happened in all of history, not just human history, but all of history. And then all mankind will see me, the Messiah, coming in the clouds with great power and glory. I'm not coming in here riding on a donkey next trip, boys. I'm coming in in great power and great glory. Just hang on because it's going to be sensational. That's anticipation. Not just the anxiety and not just the compassion, but the, ang the, the, the anticipation that if you hold that out and say to them, I'm going to come back. And I'll send out the angels. Oh, this is a great verse. I will send out the angels to gather together my chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest bounds of earth and heaven. Hallelujah. Last Sunday, we heard hallelujah. Praise the lamb. The lamb that was slain. For that provided our salvation. There's a verse over in Revelation that talks about, Herb Cain would call this an oxymoron because it talks about the wrath of the lamb. <laughs> the wrath of the lamb, you grab them, you get those shears, and you just lay them on there, and you just shear all their wool off. You take them to the slaughter. What does the scripture say? They just go to the slaughter. There they just walk in there, plunk. But the Lamb of God, when he returns, it will be in power and in glory. And when he comes, he will execute his wrath upon those who have rejected his word and have rejected his sacrifice. And Jesus gives to them this word to say to them, kind of stand on your tiptoes, guys, because there's a big day coming. 
We win. Always live with a notion we win. And I think about how little we as believers anticipate the second coming of Christ. I think about how few of us this morning got up to a day and looked out early this morning and said, Hallelujah, Lord, is this the day that you might return? Most of us just got up and went about the drudgery of shaving and showering and dressing and getting ready to go with never a thought to the second coming of Christ. Never a thought to the anticipation that we need to allow to grip us that will keep us steady in the fracas that is surely here ahead of us. I say to you this morning, I'm excited to be a part of the family of God. I'm blessed to be a part of those who carry the word of God and preach it as diligently as I know how and live it as best I know how and share it with those around me. And I think about those who are with us this morning that are lost. You've not yet come to Christ. You're lost and you hear this kind of sermon, you don't know what to do with it and you don't want to think about the second coming of Christ because you know you're not ready. Get ready. Get ready. Pull one of those cards out of that rack while we pray and fill it out and let us know you're serious by giving us a phone number. I want to talk about coming to Christ. Let us talk to you this week. We're busy. We're chasing 194 people. We're busy. But we're not too busy to spend some time with you. It's your move. Stand with me. Let's pray. Oh, Father, it is so exciting to be able to look at Jesus and pull back that curtain a little bit and see him. Anxious about that which he's about to go through. To see him so filled with compassion to those who would suffer down through the centuries carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ faithfully. Oh, we thank you for the words of anticipation. Hallelujah. What a glorious thing to anticipate the coming of Jesus Christ in mighty power and great glory. I say to those who are not yet born again, don't miss it. You ought to pull a card out and fill it out. I'm not trying to scare you into the kingdom. I'm telling you what's coming. I pray, Father, that you would bless us as we go. Accomplish your purpose. Keep us faithful to yourself. We'll give you praise in the name of the living Christ. Amen. Bless you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week.